there are two types of reforms. There's one at the scholarly level and one at, a, at the mass and the lay people's level. What I'm interested in is what reformation we need to do at a scholarly and intellectual level. If there's anything related to the to the masses and to with the lay people and what the poets do and what the poets say, I don't know. They are not the criteria. You want to reform the scholarship first and then go to the masses? We have had extensive engagement with scholarship and you also mentioned how you went to the shuyukh and you discussed istighatha with them and they had no proofs, no valid proofs to offer you. So now what is left? What kind of scholarly reform do you want at a time when the masses are dying? The masses are literally drowning and you are saying, no, no, let's first focus on, on, uh, on the scholars. These brothers and sisters, Shep, this is your community, this is my community. In that video of the poet, you were looking at the faces of the youth. Some of them I recognize from my childhood. And these are people that we should uh, be worried and concerned about. How can we say that we don't prioritize them? No, they should be the priority. Because you see, these people, they don't have their, they're innocent. They don't have that baggage. They're not deeply entrenched in their deviation. They just see it's, it's feel good. It's happening around them. No one is condemning it. So they think it's okay. It's much easier to reform these people. You know, if a, two Christians have realized the hap and the truth, and they say, but before we present to the masses, let's first go and try and convert uh, the, the, the Pope. Baba, you're wasting time. The Pope is not going to convert. He's, even if he sees the haq, his situation, his circumstances do not permit him to admit the truth. So Ayatollah Sayyidi Shaheed Muhammad Baqir Sadr is saying, Baba, if you are dreaming of reforming the scholarly establishment, forget about it. The scholarly establishment is so heavily reliant on the masses that it cannot reform the masses as much as it needs to be, as much as the masses need to be reformed. Why? Because he says, O mushkilatuna nahnu, min nas. He says, because our revenue source, our source of income is the general public, is the masses. As Ayatollah Sayyid al-Burujardi, the teacher of Sayyid Sistani says, the biggest taqiyya we have to do with the masses, they will eat us up alive if we challenge their cherished beliefs and their inherited notions. So that's why Sayyid al-Burujardi says in our fatawi also we have to practice taqiyya. And we have to give verdicts that are contrary to what we know to be the truth through our research. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We begin in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. We now proceed to the clip where Sheikh Ali Karmali has tried to argue that reform is something that we should try to focus on from the scholarly perspective first and uh, that we should be concerned about what the scholars say and engagement with the scholars before we go to the masses. So let's hear him out on this first of all, and then inshallah, I'll give you my humble uh, perspective on this. Uh, this is what the beloved Sheikh has to say in this regard. The need of reform is there, but the reform has to be done systematically. And this is where I humbly request you, humbly request you that there are two types of reforms. There's one at the scholarly level and one at, a, at the mass and the lay people's level. What I'm interested in is what reformation we need to do at a scholarly and intellectual level. And that is why I'll be sharing evidences with you from the scholars. Okay. Not that the masses are not important, but let's first sort out the first part and then we come to the second part. That's how systematically it's done. Okay. So I would request you from the in the future, if there's anything related to the to the masses and to with the lay people and what the poets do and what the poets say, I don't know. They are not the criteria. At least I don't I'm not interested in that discussion. At the moment, I'm interested in a discussion which is very scholarly at the moment. And then we will come at the next stage to the masses. 
Okay. So there are a couple of points uh, that I would like to make in this regard. First of all, the Sheikh said that there are two kinds of reform. One is at the scholarly level. One is at the level of the masses. I don't understand what the Sheikh wants us to do in this regard. He wants us to go and reform the scholars. Scholars tend to be very deeply entrenched people. And I said that there are already different camps within the scholars. Some are pro-reform, some are anti-reform, some are this, some are that. Which scholars do you exactly want to go and engage with? I mean, if you're going to go and try and engage with the vehemently pro hulu scholars, that's just like some woke Christian who has woken up to the idea that Trinity and so many of the daruriyat of the Christian madhab, yani by daruriyat we mean the essential, fundamental, foundational, core beliefs, uh, defining beliefs of Christianity. Let's say a Christian wakes up and realizes by his own critical study of the Bible and early Christian history, uh, and by applying his aql, he realizes that you know so much of this belief system is batil and uh, is uh, uh, false. So now you're telling him that, look, reform should be structured and organized. Okay, so what is your idea of structure and reform? That he should first go to the Vatican and try and reform the Pope? Is that what you are suggesting? Or he should try to reform the collegium that elects the Pope? And you want people like you and me, or at least me, who, who have the perception of being ninda bachas in the community, and we take pride in this description, we are not, claim, we are not claiming to be senior citizens, um, but you want us ninda bacha to go and somehow try and convince the Pope? Is that what you are suggesting? Or later on you say, no, 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 I'm going to bring you statements of scholars. Sheikh, why is this obsession and fixation on scholars? Yes, you can use scholars against those maybe who consider them to be hujja or who blindly worship scholars, although this is something in itself that needs to be broken uh, because the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and before them the Quran warns against this. Surah 9 verse 31 is a frequently quoted verse on our channel for this reason. اتخذوا أحبارهم وروهبانهم أرباب من دون الله Allah accuses the Jews and Christians of having taken their ahbar, who are their doctors of law, their maraji, their fuqaha, and the ruhban, the, the spiritual monks and, and spiritual gurus and leaders of Christianity, they're called ruhban. Allah says they have taken them as arbabam min dunillah. They've taken them as a rab, as sustainer, as lord besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why did he accuse them of this? Because instead of following the scripture, they were obsessed and fixated on their scholarship. What does Fula bin Fula Alim say? What does, so, what does the Pope say? What does he say? What does the scripture say? They didn't bother. Yani Allah, when he gives you a book, when he gives you a scripture, don't you see how he tells the Ahlul Kitab? Uh, I want you to grasp the book that I'm giving you, the revelation, the guidance that I'm giving you with vigor, with energy. And you take it seriously. Don't let your scholars and your leaders and your parents and your elders take you for a ride in matters that Allah has made so clear in the revelation and in the book and in the kitab uh, that he has given you. So... I do not favor this approach, Sheikh, and I don't understand uh, the wisdom behind this approach that you're trying to promote that, you know, I want, let's do it at the intellectual scholarly level. Um, what do you want to do at the scholarly level? And scholarly aqwal of what value are they if they are not mirroring and if they are not echoing, and I would even use the word parroting, uh, because that I believe parroting is desirable as far as the Quran is concerned. We should parrot the Quran as in we should repeat and rehearse to the people. Allah is instructing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the greatest mind and the noblest of intellects. He's telling the Prophet that even you, when you remind the people, what do you remind them with? Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيد. O Prophet, remind with this Quran all those who fear my threats and my punishments. So do you see the the reminders have to be Quran based. I don't, uh, I'm not a fan of this idea that, you know, guidance should be offered only, yani even myself, I'm not denying I quote scholars, but then 
maybe at the level of diagnosis, for example, to, to wake up people and make them realize that because when we present something, sometimes people think, oh, you're just a little kid. What do you know? And, and our community is fine. So, okay, at the level of showing them that you've got certain things wrong, there's no harm if you bring scholarly testimonies, but don't think that these scholarly testimonies are the ultimate guidance. No, the base has to be the Quran. You have to go to the Quran and see first and foremost, what is the Quran saying about this? And ultimately we will go by what the Quran, the scholars, we will quote in so far as they mirror and match what the Quran has said. Okay, but where they part ways with the Quran, where they part ways with the language and the wording of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim uh, or the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where we have them, then there we should dismiss the ulama and stick to the texts. Otherwise, how are we any better than the Jews and Christians whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accuses of shirk in the Quran? For what reason? Just for their blind following of their scholars, which led to a situation whereby their scholars started changing the deen. They started making halal of Allah haram and haram of Allah halal, as is mentioned in both Shia and Sunni narrations in tafsir of this verse. The Prophet also وسلم, gave the same explanation as the Imams of Ahlul Bayt وسلم, that this verse is talking about Jewish and Christian scholars and how they made halal of Allah haram, haram of Allah halal and the people followed them blindly instead of listening to what Allah had said in the scripture. If they had put the scripture above the scholars or as uh, my respected father and also Sayyidina Al-Ustad Sayyid Ali Haidar also likes to put it. Uh, if they had put the ayat of Allah over the ayats, over the ayatullahs. So you've got ayatullahs, the maraji' and the mujtahideen and the top scholars. And then you've got the ayat of Allah in the Quran. The ayat of Allah in the Quran always come above the Ayatullah who have the turbans. <coughs> what the Ayatullah with the turbans say has to be measured and compared against the Quran and the Quran verified Sunnah and teachings of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Then if it checks out and it's a perfect match, then we accept it. If it is a partial match, we accept the partial part that accepts, that matches and reject the other part which departs from the teaching of the Quran. <coughs> this is the approach, inshallah, that will enable us to save ourselves from the fate uh, that the Kuffar and uh, that the Ahlul Kitab, sorry, the Jews and Christians, uh, that they fell prey to. So I feel it is very important that we should stop with the Quran, then a hadith of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam and uh, aqwal of scholars should be brought only to highlight the current uh, situation and they should only be used in so far as they mirror and match the world view of the quran and the teaching of ahlul bayt alayhi salam so that's point number 1 point number 2 is that you're suggesting this idea you're saying i'm not interested please do not mention what's happening at the level of the masses don't mention the poets i'm not concerned about the poets you know i want to focus on intellectual reform and scholarly reform and so basically i just want to clarify i'm getting ivory tower vibes from you sheikh as in you are saying let us lock ourselves inside this ivory tower where we have these discussions in advanced usuli terminology and also uh, this ivory tower academic lingo. And let's just have that scholastic kind of reform where we're just discussing terminologies and fighting out, uh, ironing out these uh, semantics. And what is happening with the masses, that should not be our concern, that should not be our first priority. And you are, you are saying this is your idea of organized and structured reform, no, Sheikh? By the you want to reform the scholarship first and then go to the masses. We have had extensive engagement with scholarship, and you also mentioned how you went to the shuyukh and you discussed istighatha with them, and they had no proofs, no valid proofs to offer you. So you have already engaged with the scholarship, you've already seen the hal, kitne pani mein hai, how, and how much water they are, and how weak their arguments are. So now, what is left? What kind of scholarly reform do you want? 
at a time when the masses are dying. The masses are literally drowning. And you are saying, no, 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 let's first focus on, on, uh, on the scholars. The scholars, they are already set in their ways. It's like the, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. You can't expect him to reform Trinity or to reform vicarious atonement, the doctrine of vicarious atonement or the doctrine of, uh, let's say, original sin. The Pope is never going to touch these doctrines. He's too entrenched inside the system. So if you are saying, no, 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 first let's go, if let's say I'm giving you the uh, an equivalent of this, if a Christian were to say, you know, if a, two Christians have realized the hap and the truth, and they say, but before we present to the masses, let's first go and try and convert uh, the, the, the Pope. Baba, you're wasting time. The Pope is not going to convert. He's, even if he sees the haq, his situation, his circumstances do not permit him to admit the truth. The moment he admits the truth and starts reforming Christianity, his papacy will come to an end. Do you understand? So, I don't understand this obsession and this fixation on, you know, scholarly reform and scholarly this, scholarly that. Baba, scholars, yes, where they have given testimonies, where they have genuinely warned the community. Absolutely. Even I, you will have seen, I bring so many of their testimonies, which help alert the masses to where the problems are, where the deviations are. But you are saying, no, 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 let's just remain fixed on this. And let's not worry about the poets. Let's not... The poets are not the criteria. Sheikh, when did I say the poet is the criteria? But the poet is not the criterion of guidance for you and me. Na? But look at the audience in Dar es Salaam. If I, I'll request uh, the admins to play the clip again. Okay? So that they can see what I'm talking about. जिस जिसका ये ईमान है जरा वो हाथ उठाकर बताएं जो ऊपर बैठे हैं उनसे भी गुजारिश है जिसका ये ईमान है कि उसे जिंदगी हुसैन मौला ने दी है वो हाथ उठाकर बताएं द पोएट व्हेन ही रिसाइट्स द लाइंस ऑफ पोएट्री um who is sitting in front of him it's the masses and these masses when the poet encourages them towards ghulu he says i want you to raise your hands please raise your hands if you support this ghulu belief he doesn't say Gulu belief, but the belief he's presenting, we all know from the Quran and the clear teachings of Ahlul Bayt that this is Gulu, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam, disassociated from those people who used to have these beliefs. They excommunicated such people from the community. They disconnected and disassociated themselves from such people and broke ties of relationship with them uh, in order to pressure them and compel them into giving up these dangerous hell driving hell causing uh, deviations when the poet was presenting all of this he was presenting them to the youths and the youths and the community members are supporting him and they are taking what he's offering them so you are saying you know poets are not criteria for you they are not criterion sheikh but come on let's not pretend we are living inside a locked ivory tower or inside a cave even if the community has isolated you, you still can see from videos their hal. So what do you mean? Don't talk to me about the awam. Don't bring the awam. She is the ultimate focus of the scholars and people who have vested interests are not going to change. I told the Sayyidi Shaheed Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr, watch that lecture that I shared uh, and that, that I gave about why Maraja are silent. He has already shown you that Baba Maraja cannot afford to fight every battle. They cannot afford to call out every de deviation. Why? Because he says, oh, nahnu an min nas. He says, because our revenue source, our source of income is the general public, is the masses. If we upset them and if we tell them in every single case, every single deviation we highlighted for them and we warned them against it, then they're going to turn against us. The merji'iyah is not like al-islah that, you know, you people are independent, you have your own uh, professions and uh, you have your own areas of expertise and your own independent sources of earning. And so you don't care whether the masses love you or hate you, whether they deplatform you, whether they character assassinate you, you don't care. 
but the merjia cannot afford to operate like this they rely they are fully reliant on public funding and if they upset the masses too much merjia is over if the homo stops coming merjia collapses it's not like these maraja are doctors or lawyers or engineers or working professionals who will have an alternative source of income to support themselves if the masses turn against them so Ayatollah Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr is saying, Baba, if you are dreaming of reforming the scholarly establishment, forget about it. The scholarly establishment is so heavily reliant on the masses that it cannot reform the masses as much as it needs to be, as much as the masses need to be reformed. It cannot fight all battles. It cannot reform all deviations. So that is why the scholarship has to pick and choose, number one. Even after picking and choosing, they can't use the clear-cut language of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt, they try to mask, you know, we exposed one such instance in the Fatimiyah series that I did together with Ustad Sayyid Raza Rizwi, Hafizullahullah Ta'ala. Uh, we went through when uh, Sayyid al khui was asked, for example, about Fatimiyah. Can you imagine how much fitna and bala this Fatimiyah is causing? The, the narratives that are presented, Fatimiyah is such a beautiful name. Fatimiyah, if it was used to really honor and remember and pay tribute to the memory of Sayyida Fatima Zahra Salamullahi Alayha, what a beautiful, fragrant occasion it would be. But unfortunately, Fatimiyah has become an ugly spectacle that where the war drums, the drums of war are beaten. The icons of the Ummah that are revered by the mainstream Muslim Ummah Particularly the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, but even other sects like the Ibadiyah, they revere the Shaykhain. But you are using this as a, as a cursing fest, wal Iyadu Billah, to curse and abuse the revered icons of the Ummah, to badmouth them. When your own Ahlul Bayt are quoted and the Imams are quoted as saying, Imam Zayd salam in particular, as saying, Ma naqulu fihim illa khaira. وَمَا سَمِعْتُ أَحَدًا مِّنْ آبَائِي يَقُولُ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا خَيْرًا Imam Zayd alayhi salam not only testifies for himself that you say, oh, he's Imam of the Zaydis, we don't care what his opinion is. No, no, no. He says this testimony because Imam Zayd in Shia Rijal is thiqa. He's considered to be trustworthy and reliable in what he transmits from his forefathers. So Imam Zayd says, not only me, but my forefathers and ancestors before me. يعني Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam, يعني Imam Hussain alayhi salam, Ya'ani Imam Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salam, none of these would speak evil of the Shaykhain. And you people, our communities today, Fatimiyah, in the name of the Blessed Lady of Light, Sayyida Fatima sallallahu alayha, this luminous personality, this great role model, um, in her name, disunity and division is being caused. And fabricated narrations are being presented to stoke people's emotions and to rile them up and mobilize hatred against uh, the Ummah and its icons. And uh, the solution was what? The solution was for the highest level merji'iyya and scholarship to openly come out. Well, they openly came out and did say that don't abuse the icons of the Ummah. But this is just like saying this is problematic. Lakini, what is the cause? What is, why is it problematic? If you just tell the people, the Shia people that look, don't curse and abuse. But at the same time, you don't do anything to expose the narrative, the fabrications which are causing them to develop such visceral feelings of hatred against the icons of the Ummah. If you don't address the underlying fabrications that are the fuel for this fire, then how are you going to reform? And that's why the Marji'iyya, I saw this with my own eyes in Stanmo, in Dar Islam, in so many places, open and public cursing. And especially on Eid Zahra, all the bulb and everything. What is this? Now, what was the solution? Solution was for someone of the level of Ayatollah Sayyid Abul Qasim al khui His research, we showed you, clearly shows that the Fatimiyah narrative is a fabrication. It has la asla lahu. It has no basis aslan. It is based on concocted and fabricated narrations which cannot be authenticated as per the manage of Sayyid al khui now, if Sayyid al Hui had <clears throat> not resorted to using ivory tower or Hausa ivory tower academic language, and if he had spoken out clearly and openly against this, because we showed you, he was asked in the istifta, he was asked, what do you say about this incident of the door, the attack on Sayyid Fatima, her ribs being broken, all of this. Is it sahih? 
Is it authentic the uh, reports about this? Are they authentic as per your manhaj? He should have said, answered very openly and said, Baba, these are all da'if and we showed you. We opened Mu'ajam Rijal al-Hadith and through his research how all of these narratives collapse. But no, he opted for, and again, I don't, I don't know if we can pass moral judgment on him even in circumstances. He has to live in a state of major, major taqiyya. People think he was doing taqiyya from Saddam. No, he's, he, as Ayatollah Sayyid al-Burujardi, the teacher of Sayyid Sistani says, the biggest taqiyya we have to do with the masses, they will eat us up alive if we challenge their cherished beliefs and their inherited notions and preconceived ideas which they have emotionally become attached to. So that's why Sayyid al-Burujardi says in our fatawi also we have to practice taqiyya. And we have to give verdicts that are contrary to what we know to be the truth through our research. So Sayyid al khui through his research knows this whole narrative is a fabrication. Yani we having studied uh, his rijal, we know this. So he himself would not know this. But then look at the language he uses. He, when he's asked about this narrative, instead of clearly and openly saying that this is not Sahih Baba, this is fabrication, this is that. Because he knows how emotionally charged and how sensitive people tend to be about this and how intolerant they are about. So he uses such language. Subhanallah. And we showed you his exact words. He said, ذَلِكَ مَشْهُورٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَاللَّهُ الْعَالِمِ He used the, the kind of tawriya language that a person who has not studied ilmul usul properly and thoroughly will think he is endorsing this narrative. And he's saying, yes, ذَلِكَ مَشْهُورٌ مَعْرُوفٌ means that this is famous and this is popular. But the questioner did not ask popular and famous. The fact that I'm I, the layperson, and asking you about this means it's famous and popular. How else did I come to know about this? I'm not asking you if it's famous and popular in our community. And there are so many khurafat that are, tahrif used to be very popular, right? All sorts of khurafat are popular. The tooth fairy is mashhoor and ma'roof among today's children. We're not asking you whether it is famous and popular. We're asking you, is it sahih? Rijalically speaking, you are the expert and grandmaster of Ilm rijal You're the teacher of the most of the greatest authorities of Rijal today. Is it sahih? Simple question. But no, he can't answer the simple question. So he has to, he goes into his usuli terminology and he takes the cover of usuli terminology. That is Mashur Ma'roof. And then we went into the books of his Usul. We, the Ninda Bachas, then had to open the books of Usul and show you how in the methodology of Sayyidul Khui, Shuhra, Shuhra, something being famous and popular, Aslan is not Hujja. It has no Hujja, no probative value at all. He rejects so many of the Mashur and Ma'roof things in his Bahthul Kharij, in his Fiqhi Buhus, in his detailed discussions, because he says something being popular and famous in itself does not prove that it is something that you can rely upon and that it, is, it, it can serve as hujjah between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that is where in the advanced usuli books, to the masses, mashhurun ma'ruf, the layperson hears mashhurun ma'ruf, he thinks, oh, Sayyidul al is saying, yeah, this is very well established, it is well known, it is famous, so therefore it is the truth. Whereas in reality, in his usuli understanding, mashhurun ma'ruf means the complete opposite. So this, with this kind of approach, can you actually reform? Well, look, Sayyid al Khui wrote this fatwa of Mashur and Ma'roof. In his language, he was saying that this whole Fatimiyah narrative, it has not a single Sahih chain. Even if single Sahih chain existed, Sayyid al Khui would catch it and say, Yeah, we have Sahih chain for it. There doesn't exist any Sahih chain for this narrative. It's not authentically transmitted. The Ahlul Bayt did not authentically transmit this to you. You don't have any evidence from them for this, except fabrications of Ghulat. So now, we should abandon it, but you can't. This is so emotionally charged issue. So that's why he has to. So this is scholarly reform, Sheikh. Why are you interested in this kind of reform? This kind of reform will achieve nothing. Sayyid al-Khui, this fatwa he gave how many decades ago? Today, Fatimiya, look at the energy and vigor with which it is happening. So when you will do scholarly reform in, in ivory tower, academic, technical, Hausawi, usuli jargon, no one will understand what you're trying to say. If when the people of knowledge try to make uh, understand that Baba Sayyid al-Khui here, this is what he means. He says, no, no, no. This is, I don't understand this. Baba, study al usul No, I'm a layperson. I have not studied al usul Okay, then trust the people who study al usul Trust Sayyid al-Khui himself in his usuli mabahith when he tells you what the real meaning of mashhur and ma'roof is and what probative value 
<laughs> does mashur and ma'roof have? So no, 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 no. Then it becomes a very long process. And the masses are like, you know what? These complicated things we don't understand. We will just do inna wajadna aba'ana ala ummatin. We found our forefathers doing this and we just want to continue this. Don't disturb us. Don't bother us with all these researches. So, Sheikh, this kind of attitude of, you know, I want to focus on scholarly reform. Scholarly reform, what is there, Sheikh? The, scholarly, the scholars themselves have acknowledged that, Baba, we can't reform. We can't reform every deviation. We have to pick and choose our battles. So, okay, good. We should support them in those battles where they are courageous enough and which they have picked to fight. But what about those battles that they are too um, diplomatic in or that they are not, they don't have the uh, the courage or the circumstances don't permit them to speak out so openly. So those are the gaps which you, the Ninda Bacha, or rather not you, but us, the Ninda Bacha, this, those are the gaps that are left for us to fill then. Because when the adults, and they chicken out, then the little kids have to come and do their duty. So this aspect of your appeal, I find, um, I'm going to use your your language because to you this is very clear, I find very problematic. Okay, la yakhlu min ishkal hada. Uh, to use your language and language that you are most comfortable with. Yeah, this is not something that I find uh, appealing or that I find to be uh, the, the correct course of action. Bayni wa Allah. We should, uh, scholars, okay, if you can do it on the side, do it. But the focus should be the awam. Because look, Sheikh, the issues, the areas of deviation, we don't have the time or luxury to first reform the whole scholarly establishment, uh, or a major part of it and then we turn to the awam. We don't have time. In the meantime, people are dying. Senior citizens are dying. The young people in COVID were dying. Death can come at any time. So let's not waste our time on things tilting at windmills and mountains that are not going to move. People who are too deeply entrenched, people who have vested interests, people who for whatever reasons, they're themselves, Sayyidi Shaheed Muhammad Baqil Sadr is admitting that Baba, we naskutu anhum qalila, so many things we have to uh, remain silent a little bit. We can't afford to fight every battle. So, okay, they can't afford to fight it. If you can afford to fight it, you have a platform. Some of the community members have given you this platform and this opportunity. So you do the best that you can. So that the areas where they have done their job, we can highlight those areas. Where they have not done their job, we still have the Quran. Alhamdulillah, we're not reliant exclusively on scholars. We still have the Quran. Whether the scholars speak the truth or not, Quran has stated the truth. We have the Prophet وسلم, and the noble Imams from his progeny, from the Ahlul Bayt, Ali Muslim, they have spoken the truth. Whether the Maraja are in a position to speak the truth or not, doesn't matter. Ahlul Bayt have said the truth. Na? They have condemned all these deviations in the strongest and clearest language. Let us present that and let us present it to the masses. The focus should be the masses because, Sheikh, these deviations are not a joke. They are not uh, something I absolutely disagree with this terminology that we just say that these deviations are problematic. That, that is the end of it. Sheikh, if it was just a matter of these deviations being problematic, Wallahi, wa billahi, wa tallahi. I would not be prepared to give the kind of uh, sacrifice that you have to give to walk on this path, to, to blow the whistle, to warn the people. It would not be worth it, Sheikh. If, if these deviations were just minor problematic stuff that, you know, Allah would look at, at on the Day of Judgment and be like, yeah, this is okay. Uh, this is sagha'ir. These are small, small things I can overlook. Yeah, if it was just problematic, Sheikh, I would be the furthest person away from al-Islah. You would, you would never see me here on this platform. I would be on sitting on my traditional mimbar, refuting those who are making a big deal of you know stuff that is just uh, problematic. Or I would not be refuting maybe, but I would, I would not be siding with their cause. If this was minor deviation or minor issues. Yeah, ya Sheikh. This is major, especially when we talk about dua to ghayrullah. This practice of invoking and supplicating to entities other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala across the curtain of ghaib. This is so serious. Allah takes it so seriously. The threats he has issued are so serious that we simply cannot afford to say, you know what, let's look at what the, let's reform first at the scholarly level, engage with the scholars. Although we have already done that, alhamdulillah, before we started al-Islah, if you look at my 
lecture uh, response to the practical priest. I've talked about our engagement with scholars. You can refer to that lecture. So before we did this, we had engagement at, at very many levels with the scholarship. And after that, we started Al-Islah when we realized that even those scholars who realize that this is all wrong, they're saying, look, we are stuck, you know, we don't have an independent source of earning and livelihood. So we can't speak out against these things because we'll just get fired. We'll get deplatformed, we'll get marginalized. And then we have no other, we, we will basically, uh, we have no other source of income or earning. This is, religion is what we uh, rely upon. And so we can't uh, reform and take such a big risk. So when we realized that, you know, the scholars who know uh, the truth are not in a position, that's when we came to Al-Islah to say that, okay, if our circumstances are currently permitting us to state the truth, and uh, so then let us do it. So I don't believe in this idea of banking on, you know, this scholarly reform and focusing and fixating on that because Awam is these uh, these brothers and sisters. Yep, this is your community. This is my community. In that video of the poet, you were looking at the faces of the youth. Some of them I recognize from my childhood. And these are people that we should uh, be worried and concerned about. How can we say that we don't prioritize them? No, they should be the priority. Because you see, these people, they don't have their, their innocent uh, to a great degree. They're both innocent and they are overcome with ignorance. And so... They don't have that baggage. They're not deeply entrenched in their deviation. They just see it's it's feel good. It's happening around them. No one is condemning it. So they think it's okay. It's much easier to reform these people because they don't have a, these youth. They don't have a vested interest. They're not earning money from all this wulu. Yes, they have. They are getting entertainment from it. And so they, some of them might be emotionally attached to this kind of entertainment and they might not be willing to let go of it. But at least the serious ones who are serious about their hereafter, at least they they will give thought to what you are telling them now. So, Sheikh, absolutely no. This is why we want you to come to Al-Islah. Don't lock yourself inside an ivory tower and get obsessed and fixated on our scholar. Ne amarja aki do che, ne ana fatwa ache, ne he has used this terminology. And Baba, leave that aside. Come to the Quran. Look at what the Quran is saying. Very quickly, I just want to show you and remind you the Quran, when it talks about dua to Ghayrullah, look at the kind of language and look at the kind of threats Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues when it comes to dua to Ghayrullah. He says, فَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ Okay, I hope uh, this is uh, visible. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is saying what? فَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ Who is a greater zalim, greater wrongdoer than him, mimman? iftara ala Allahi kadiban who fabricates a lie against Allah basically all these gulu narratives are lies that were fabricated against Allah when the claim was made that Allah has given these divine powers to the imams when you make a false claim about Allah you are inventing a false claim about Allah this is iftira and Allah is saying this is the biggest dhulm in nine separate places in the Quran Allah repeats this phrase huh? وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنِ iftara ala Allahi kadiban who can be a greater zalim than the one who invents a lie and falsely ascribes it to Allah. Allah says, I don't allow you to attribute anything to me unless you have authorization, unless you have my own testimony in the book, in the scripture, confirming that, yes, I have actually said this. Then you can attribute it to me. But otherwise, from your own pocket, from your own imagination, you start attributing things to me, which is basically what the ghulat were doing. And the Mufawwidha, Allah says, this is the biggest possible zulm that you can do in my sharia. Ah. Fabricates a lie against Allah. Or, aw bi ayati, Or denies his signs. Allah says, Ula'ika yanaluhum nasibuhum min al-kitab. Their share as decreed in the book shall reach them. Yani Allah says, in dunya, if you do iftira against me, or you deny my signs, you will still get your share of rizq and enjoyment in this dunya. Whatever I've written for you and decreed for you in the book of decrees shall reach you. Okay? It will come to you. So, Allah is saying, it's not like you're going to die hungry or I'm going to strike you with lightning immediately the moment you, you do an iftira or believe in an iftira or promote an iftira. I'm just going to ask the earth to swallow you or Allah says, none of that. None of that is going to happen. Ula'ika yanaluhum nasibuhum min al-kitab. Allah says in this dunya, 
whatever I have written for you in the book will come to you. All the risk, the job, the job promotions, uh, offspring, all the wealth that Allah has written for you, you will still get it. So dunya ma, you don't get that. You, you will not feel anything is wrong. You will feel Alhamdulillah, Allah is blessing me. He must be happy with me. I have so many favors. I have so many good things in life that Allah keeps on giving me. And Allah says, yes, because I've given you all the warnings in the scripture. I expect you to read the scripture. I'm not going to send lightning from the sky or a letter from the a special letter to you from the sky to tell you that this is wrong. I've already told you everything in the Quran. So now Allah says that this, you, you will live a normal life. If you do iftira upon Allah or you believe in iftira about Allah here in this dunya, whatever, however much I've written for you, you will get it. Tatizo, Shauriyako, the problem will begin when? And this is why Dua to Ghayrullah is, if you want to say it is problematic, then you explain what is the problem. Problem suchiyama. Problem aache ki Allah Ta'ala is saying, Hatta idha jaathum rusuluna yatawafawnahum. Until our angels, our messengers who are the angels, huh? that is angels of death. Okay? Allah says, when these messengers of mine, Come to take them away at the end of life, yani at the time of death. Look at the very first question the angels are trained to ask such people. First question. Question number one they ask. Where is that which you used to invoke, that you used to tad'oon, do dua to? Min dunillah. Other than and lesser than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So can you imagine, Shaykh, now this is no longer something that we can say, oh, no, no, let's spend the next 20, 30 years, you know, focusing on scholars, engaging with scholars, discussing istilahat, terminologies, usul, mabani, rijal, this, that. Meanwhile, senior citizens in our community are listening to that poet. And they are seeing that the turbans are also approving of what the poet is saying and is teaching them that yes, Mawla Hussein is giving you rizq, Mawla Hussein is giving you all of this, Mawla Hussein will respond to your supplications, Imam Ali is the mushkil kusha, he is the one who is going to relieve you of all your troubles and distress. All of these teachings are being spread among the awam and you are saying no, 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 let's not focus on them first. Structured and organized reform means we should focus on the scholars, let the awam die in the meantime. As while we are working on our, you know, ivory tower scholarly reform, the senior citizens are dying on this deviant belief and angels of death are coming to them and asking them, Aina ma kuntum tad'una min dunillah? They don't say, Aina al-asnam allati kuntum tad'una min dunillah. They don't say, where are the idols? They say, no, no, Aina ma kuntum tad'una min dunillah. So where are those? Where is that which you used to call upon besides Allah? Anything if you call upon besides Allah across ghayb, Angels, Allah is saying, make no mistake about it. Angels will humiliate you with this question at the time of death. In Madrasa, they teach you Barzakhma. The Qabrma, your first question is Mar Rabbuk and then Mar Rasuluk. And Quran is saying, questioning of the grave, leave it. Uh, th th that, is a, so that is afterwards. At the very moment of death, the angels first question they ask. And they ask this to humiliate the person and make him realize that he has failed his test. And fire is waiting for him. First question they ask, Aina ma kuntum? They don't say, Who is your Lord? Who is your Allah? Because this, a mushrik can pass. A mushrik or a person guilty of shirk can pass this. Even a Christian Trinitarian would say, Yes, Allah is my Lord. The Kufara Mushrikin of Makkah, la in sa'altahum man khalaqa samawati wal arda. If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would say, Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth. So if the angels were to simply ask, who is your God? They would pass the test. Allah says, that's why I train the angels. I instruct them. Ask them the question that will expose their deviation. They used to believe in me as the creator and sustainer and everything. And still they were doing dua to other than me. They dared to invoke and supplicate entities lesser than and other than me. The first humiliating question that they will get is, Where are they? You do, those pious slaves, those angels, those prophets, those imams, those awliya, where are they now? You spent your whole life. First of all, you read iftira upon Allah when you said that Allah has empowered them to respond to our prayers and supplications with his bi-iznihi, bi-iznihi, with his permission. So you did iftira. Okay. 
and say, Allah, why didn't you warn me in this dunya? I say, Baba, we warned you in the in the kitab. Say, but Ya Allah, I used to ask these entities and I used to get all the risk and wealth and promotions and all of that. Allah says, I said in the scripture, kitab. These people will get their share from the book of decrees. What I've written for them, they will get. You will get your risk. Even if you ask Ghayrullah, even you ask Mawla Abbas for offspring, you ask Mawla Imam Rida for Shifa, if Allah has written it in the book, you will get it. Not because Mawla Abbas and Mawla Imam Rida السلام, have the powers. No, no, they don't have any powers in this regard. But Allah is saying, if I've written it in the book of decree, it doesn't matter. Even if you ask a stone, you will still get it. But Allah says, Shawriyako, that the moment of death is when you will realize what a fool you were. To leave Allah and invoke entities other than him across the curtain of ghaib. Even if they be his most uh, pious and beloved chosen slaves. So returning to the Quran, look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. This is what should be presented to the awam. The ulama, they know all these ayat. It is the awam who are ghafil and oblivious and not alert to these reminders of Allah. So they are asked, where is that which you used to invoke besides Allah? Look at the answer of the dying person. Huh? Or the dying people. قَالُوا ضَلُّوا anna. They will say they have forsaken us. They will say they have forsaken us. Yani the entities that we were calling upon, they have forsaken us. They have abandoned us. We can't see them. The angels are saying, where are they? You used to claim that there are entities across the curtain of ghaib who can hear you, who can listen to you, who can come to your help. Where are they now? And the dying person in humiliation at, ha at having realized that he has failed the test of this life, he is guilty of the worst crime possible in Islam, which is shirk. Now he is having to admit that, yes, dallu anna. I can't see them anywhere. They have forsaken me. They have abandoned me. And don't blame anyone but yourself because the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, in their books, they had warned you in dunya itself that we will have nothing to do. We will disassociate and have nothing to do. We will not recognize you as our follower or our lover if you fall into these deviations. So now look at what the Quran then says. They will, they will say they have forsaken us. They will testify against themselves that they were faithless. Then, Natija, Allah says, Qalad Khulufi Uma Min Kad Khalat Min Kablikum Min Al Jinni Wal Insi Finnar. This is not minor deviation. This is not it's something you say, oh, it is problematic. I disagree with it, but you know, we should not be doing it and move on. Allah says, Baba, this is not a joke. You think invoking, supplicating, doing dua to entities lesser than me. You think this is a joke in my deen? This is core. Pure shirk in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah says, I will not leave you. I will not, judgment will not wait until judgment uh, day for you. At the time of death, hisab will begin. Humiliation and punishment will begin. And at the very moment of death, Allah says, your fate will be announced to you. Where are you going? He will say, enter along with the nations who passed before you of jinn and humans into the fire. And Allah says, you have a lot of company. If you are doing dua and istighatha to entities other than Allah across the curtain of ghaib, you have plenty of company. You're not the first deviants to do this. Generations of people did this before you. You now get to go and join them in the fire of hell. Well, ayyadu billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, our communities. May Allah awaken people's eyes. And Shaykh, may Allah also awaken the eyes of the scholars to understand that, Baba, we cannot wait for the scholarship and the establishment to, to get their act right. Okay? They took centuries to reform just tahrif. Okay? And they still haven't be managed to reform so many of the other deviations of the Safavid era. If you are going to wait for them and get things straight with them, it's going to take ages. In the meantime, people will die on deviation. So that is why we need to come and at least remind them that, Baba, this is what Allah has said in the Quran. Even if the scholars, let's say, because their circumstances don't permit, are not presenting you guidance, Allah has still not left us without guidance. He has told you, Dua to Ghayrullah, to any entity other than and lesser than me, besides me, is zero tolerance policy. You will end up in the fire. 
if you do this. And then every time Allah says, Kullama dakhalat ummatul la'anat ukhtaha. Every time a community, a nation enters hell, it will curse its sister nation. Then Allah says, Hatta idha daraku fiha jami'an qalat ukhrahum li ulahum. Rabbana haulai adalluna fa'atihim adaban dhi'fan minan nar. When they all rejoin in it, the last of them will say about the first of them, Our Lord, it was they who led us astray. So give them a double punishment of the fire. Do you see the people in the fire of hell are now saying, Okay, Allah, we have ended up here in the fire. This is the worst possible outcome. But we even in the fire, we have one request. We are begging you. Those who misguided, yani the scholars, the leaders, the a'immatul kufri wa shirk wal ghulu, the imams of misguidance, huh? the ghulat, and the promoters of ghulu from among the scholars and the Molvis and everyone else who led us down this dark path and this path of perdition and damnation. Ya Allah, we beg you, we request you from the fire of hell. They're begging Allah and saying, Ya Allah, atihim adaban minan nar. Okay, it's your justice that we should be punished. We have accepted our punishment. But Ya Allah, please double the punishment of these scholars and these leaders who brought us here. Look at the answer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You would think Allah would say, yeah, I accept. I, I will double the punishment of the scholars and the leaders and the a'immatul kufri wal ghuluwi wal shirk. I'm going to double the punishment of the promoters because they were guilty of this. They were people of knowledge and yet they deceived you. But Allah says, no, I'm not going to uh, discriminate today. He says, qala li Allah says, don't worry, it is double for each of you, but you do not know. Yani Allah says, for the ulama and the leaders, their punishment, don't worry, it will 100% be doubled. But you, the awam, you, the lay masses, your punishment will also be doubled. Say, Allah, we were mistaken. What were we supposed to do? We trusted these scholars. We tr Allah says, I didn't give you kitab. I didn't give you scripture. I didn't give you aql. I didn't give you clear guidance. This, this, this Quran was not there in your bookshelf. You had never read this ayah in which I was warning you that at the time of death, when our messengers will come to take your soul, they will say, where is that which you used to invoke besides Allah? Okay, you are not supposed to invoke anyone other than Allah. What stopped you from saying, Ya Allah, this verse mana is scary. He's saying if I invoke other than Allah, okay, I'm not going to invoke anyone other than Allah across the Bible. Even if Marajah say, they don't say, my resident Alim says, doesn't say, I don't care, man. I'm not willing to take this risk that at the time of death, angels humiliate me and then send me to uh, announce that I'm supposed to go to hell. I am not prepared to take. And how much energy does it take to you to reform? All you have to say is, I will, from today, I will only do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask all my hajat from him and him alone across the curtain of ghayb. How much energy do you need for this? And especially when, when Allah has told you in the Quran, Udu'uni astajib lakum. Call upon me and I'll answer you, Surah 40, verse 60. If Allah had said in the Quran, well, Iyadu Billah, if He had said, don't you ever dare call upon me, then I could say, okay, you have a case, man. You, you can say on the day of judgment, Ya Allah, you know, we were needy people. We had hajat, we had problems, we had this, we had that. And you had completely sealed and blocked the door to approach you. So that's why we approached your slaves because they were the next best thing that we had. Allah will say, Udu'uni astajib lakum. Wa idha sa'alaka ibadi anni fa inni qareebun ujibu da'wata da'i idha da'an fal yastajibu li wal yu'minu bi la'allahum yarshudun. Allah said, I told you in the Quran, I'm near to you. Who told you you need to go to third parties to approach me? I am nearer to you than your jugular vein. I am nearer to you than those third parties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nearer to us than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nearer to us than the imams of Ahlul Bayt. He is closer to us than our jugular vein. He listens to our calls and our cries when we call out to him. So why did you go to third parties? Once my father was in Dar es Salaam, it was 15th of Sha'ban. Someone was writing Ariza. So my father asked him, what is this? He said, I'm writing Ariza to Hussein bin Rauh. He said, okay, and what will Hussein bin Rauh do? He said, he'll take my wish list. Peleka it, take it, uh, make it reach the 12th Imam. So he said, okay, and then what will the 12th Imam do? So he said, the 12th Imam will look at my wish list, my hajat, and then he will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me. The Imam said, so, so, sorry, my father said, this long, lengthy, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to you than your jugular vein. To talk to Allah and present your hajat before him, you are first writing to a fallible, 
representative who is dead, he's not even a shaheed that you say he's alive, he's dead in his grave, Hussein bin Rawah. And then you are telling that dead person in his grave that you please take my letter and make it reach the 12th Imam, okay? And then the 12th Imam will, do you see the red tape and bureaucracy that you have turned relationship with Allah into? Asuche. So my father, my respected father, he used to address individuals in Dar es Salaam and tell them, Baba, what, what is it that you're doing? Asuche. And, and which teaching of the Quran is this? That you write uh, letters to dead people and then you throw it in the ocean and then you hope that the dead person, I don't know from where he'll swim into the ocean and then he will pick up the letter. He will peleka, take it to the 12th Imam. 12th Imam will then uh, read your letter and be like, okay, he wants new car, new job, this, that. And then he will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who taught you this? Okay, when the Imams are physically accessible, it makes sense. I would myself do this if I had physical access to an Imam of Ahlul Bayt and I was writing letters to him. Okay, no problem. But in this situation, what is the what is the purpose of, of all of this? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all this time in the Quran, he's calling you, he's telling you, Baba, come and do dua to me. I am there to listen to you. And I am Sami'un Basir. I know everything. I listen to everything. I am the one. Allah is saying, who other than me is there? Who responds to the call and the istighatha of the distressed person? And removes evil. Who other than me? Allah. After saying, He makes you his, uh, the executors of his will on this earth. He leaves you as khulafa to fulfill his vision on this earth. Who other than Allah does this? Allah. Is there a God together with Allah? And what are you saying? When you are invoking other entities, you are saying, yes, I believe there are other entities. You might not call them God, but you're treating them like God. So in any case, Sheikh, our focus should be on saving as many people from the awam. Don't tell me that awam are not important or you'll say, no, no, awam are important, but first let's sort the scholarly. No, no, no. What scholarly? Quran is there. If, if the scholars are not uh, di uh, united on this, if they are divided, put them aside or at least take those scholars who do agree with the narrative of the Quran on this. Right. So I don't, I don't, Sheikh, this is one area which will be an irreconcilable um, difference. This idea of if this is your idea of organized and structured reform, I have already refuted it in my response to the practical priest. He was suggesting the same thing that you go and discuss with the Marajia and the scholars and the Mujtahideen and the resident. Baba, we've already done that. We've already seen what kind of answers and evidence they have. We've already seen their majburi, their limited circumstances and how they can't do this uh, as openly and as, uh, uh, as transparently as uh, an Islah platform is offering us the opportunity to do. So we, we, we do what we can do and we don't bank and rely and place our expectations and hope in something that is either not going to happen or that's going to take eternity to happen or that's going to take ages to happen. So if you want to devote yourself to this process, I'm no one to stop you, Sheikh, but I'm just telling you that this is a waste of time. This is counterproductive. If you can do it without affecting your work with the awam, then that's fine. But uh, otherwise, if you are ignoring the awam and if you are not sharing guidance with the awam and if you are not being honest with them and forthright with them and you're not sharing the Quranic warnings and reminders, Allah instructed the Prophet in Surah Al-An'am, He said, وَذَكِّرْ بِهِ أَن تُبْسَلَ نَفْسٌ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ لَيْسَ لَهَا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيٌّ وَلَا شَفِيعٌ He said, O oh, Prophet, take this Quran and warn and remind the people with it, lest a time come when a soul should be should find itself in grave disappointment due to what it earned by going against what I had said in this book. And Allah is telling the Prophet, constantly remind the people of the my teachings in this Quran, my warnings, my punishments, what I have forbidden, what I have warned against. Constantly keep on remind, reminding the people of this. Allah's message to the Prophet was not that you just sit with a bunch of ulama and you discuss usuli terminology with them and you 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 focus on just reforming the ulama and no no with the average ma with the farmer with the peasant with the average people remind them with, of my warnings lest Allah is saying it is, if you don't do that a time will come if you don't remind people of the Quran they will end up going against the Quran and then on the day of judgment Allah says I will arrest them and I will 
uh, involve them in punishment. And at that time, they will be completely helpless and they will be uh, in abject disappointment and disillusionment and distress. And لَيْسَ لَهَا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيُمْ وَلَا شَفِيعٌ At that time, they will have no one lesser than and other than Allah who can bail them out, who can rescue them, who can do shafa'ah for them, or who can be an ally or helper to them. وَإِن تَعْدِلْ كُلَّ عَدْلٍ لَا يُخَذْ مِنْهَا And Allah says at that point, you offer any ransom. You know, in this world, when you go to prison, you sometimes pay bail. If you're very rich, you can even pay millions of dollars and you come out of the jail. Allah says, إِن تَعْدِلْ كُلَّ عَدْلٍ لَا يُخَذْ مِنْهَا if you give the if you offer me the highest amount of bail imaginable, I'll not take it. I gave you all the warnings in dunya. I gave you enough time in this dunya. If you get arrested in the hereafter, you're not coming out. Allah says, and you think shafa and all these things. Allah says, if you go against this Quran, if the people go against my clear guidance in the Quran, no wali and no shafi'a for them. Say Allah, but in other verses of the Quran, you said that لا يملكون الشفاعة إلا من أذن له الرحمن. Uh, that no one will be able to do shafa except those whom you have permitted on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in this verse is not talking about people for whom he will allow shafa. He's talking about those for whom he will not allow shafa. Yani those who went against his clear teaching in the Quran, Allah is saying for these people I'll not accept any shafa. Shafa is if you lived your whole life to the fullest possible extent. According to the Quran, you took my warnings, my guidance seriously. And then human weakness, you you had failings, you had shortcomings, you committed some sins here and there, but you kept on repenting and you were serious. Then Allah says, okay, you are someone who is praiseworthy in my sight despite your flaws and defects. I can allow shafa for you to those whom I permit. But not that you ignore the Quran, you blindly follow scholars, you don't care what the Quran says, and then you expect that on the day of judgment, Allah will say, okay, even if you went wrong, no problem, you have... Wali and Shafi' in the thousands or in the hundreds, they will do Shafa for you, you can go to Jannah. This is not how it works. So that is why, beloved Shaykh, I believe we should take these warnings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very seriously. And uh, we should understand no one will help us on the Day of Judgment. Scholars are not going to take the blame for this. And uh, if we request Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah give them double punishment because they fooled us, Allah will say you will also get double punishment. Who told you to blindly follow them? When did I ever say you blindly follow scholars? I gave you book of bayinat. Allah says, كَذَلِكَ نُبَيِّنُ الْآيَاتِ كَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِ Throughout the Quran, how many times Allah repeats, thus do I make my signs clear to you. Thus do I make my revelations clear to you. Thus do I make my revelations manifest before you. Allah has simplified and made this book easy. At least as far as heaven and hell issues are concerned, it is not the least bit complicated. What is You tell me, what is complicated about this ayah? What do you, you need 70 years of study in the Hawza to just understand that Allah does not like you to do dua to entities other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You need 70, 90, 100 years in the Hawza for, the, for this simple teaching? So simple and clear. And forgive me if I'm passionate, but I am really... Uh, sickened by the fact that such clear teachings of the Quran are violated and constantly from the member um, you watch Aftab Shia channel and these other channels they are promoting this one single hulu narrative like it is gospel and there is no one to challenge it so Sheikh let me personally the whole reason why I'm focusing on the awam personally I can tell you is because well, first of all, apart from all the obligations the Quran imposes on us, Amr bin Ma'roof, Nahi al Munka, but if you want to ask me on a personal, worldly level, why I'm doing this, it is to return the Ihsan, these communities, both you and me, Sheikh, we are products of these communities, number one. Number two, these communities have been very generous to us. Okay, right now, because we are telling them the bitter truth, they may be cursing and abusing and character assassinating and hating them, our guts. But before this, there was a period when they were absolutely in love with us and they were our biggest fans and supporters and lovers and, and they were so generous and gracious to us and they gave us so many opportunities to grow and to benefit. And I mean, we cannot, if I start talking about the ihsanat of the community, the Khoja community of Dar es Salaam on me and on my father and on my family and how much I benefited from association with them, it will be an extremely long lecture. 
And if you want a summary of it, you can uh, look at my father's message to Dar es Salaam where he talks about some of that. But basically, uh, how can we turn our back on, on the awam and just go and focus on the scholars? What have the scholars done for you and me? Okay. Uh, uh, the biggest ihsanat on us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came on us. Okay, so through scholars are also a source, but scholars ultimately, well, I don't understand well, how will you reform the scholars? It's like saying, let's go reform the Christian Pope. We have such clear verse in Quran against Trinity. Let's present it to the Pope. It's Baba. Okay, I don't mind you presenting it to the Pope, but good luck to you if you think you can. Well, his situation, his his circumstances, reform is never going to come from there. For the Catholic, the Catholic has to look at other sources for guidance. The Catholic Pope is not going to tell him, is, he can't afford to tell him these truths. You understand? Even if he wants to, even let's say, uh, if, if the Catholic Pope internally, let's say he were to undergo an epiphany, which makes him realize all the deviations and all the hulu, what can he do? The whole system will close, will crack down on him. So it's the, it's the similar kind of situation we, in our sect when the up, it's, it's when the Aqidah has been completely turned upside down. It's not easy to, you know, it took centuries and so much of ghulat and fabrications and political circumstances, Ottoman threat, Safavid power, so many things combined to bring the Shiaism of today where it is today. So you want to just flip it back up and you think it's easy, you will not meet resistance, you will not meet opposition, you think uh, the entire scholarly establishment will help you in this, you're mistaken, Sheikh. So that's why these communities, they have so much, they've done so much good to us. And that's why I sometimes wonder, and I'm amazed when these people think, say that, oh, you know, Al-Islam misguiding this, Baba, we are products of your own community. And why would we, Why? what would we get from misguiding you? What I don't understand. What would I get from misguiding you? In dunya, I'm only getting hate and curses and abuses, character assassination, deplatforming, ostracization, all the evil and harms you can think I'm getting them. So what is it that pushes me to keep on telling you that, Baba, please, for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, repent and change your deviant practices before it is too late before the angels at the time of death come and grab your neck and say show me where is where are the mullahs and where are the imams and where are these any entity lesser than and other than allah allah doesn't mention the names of the entities he doesn't say where are the idols or where are the prophets allah says Min dunillah. A complete blanket any entity that was lesser than and other than allah if you are doing dua to it humiliation Angels ask you the question and your response, Allah says, I, I'm already telling you. At that time, when you look around, you'll see there is no Mawla Abbas, there is no Mawla Ali, no one is coming to my help. So you will say, Ballu Anna. I used to call them in dunya, but now they have all gone astray. They have all, sorry, Ballu Anna here is not the literal Ballu. It is, they have forsaken me, they have abandoned me, they have disappeared and vanished. They are nowhere to help me. So before that happens, Sheikh, we need to earnestly and vigorously and relentlessly try our best to warn and awaken the, uh, the masses and open their eyes. And yes, no, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says there are some people who are so stubborn. وَلَوْ أَنَّنَا نَزَّلْنَا إِلِهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ وَكَلَّمَهُمُ الْمَوْتَ وَحَشَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ قُبُلًا مَا كَانُوا لِيُؤْمِنُوا إِلَّا إِنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Surah Al-An'am, Surah 6, verse 111. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there are some people who if we were to reveal angels to them. And if the dead people from the graves were to get up and talk to them, they were to speak to them and tell them, Baba, all this you are doing is deviation. It is wrong. It will cost you big time in the Akhirah. It will destroy and ruin your Akhirah. If the dead people were to get up and talk to these people, some of the stubborn people, Allah says if I were to resurrect everything in front of them so that it would all the realities would stare them in the face Allah says they would still not believe such people exist in our communities even today we have engaged with them we have interacted with them okay at least we present the guidance to them after that they reject people even rejected prophets when they presented guidance yeah so if people can reject guidance of prophets, then where do you and I stand, right? We are, we are not even in, in the neighborhood of that area. So, but the important thing is we present the guidance. Some will accept, as you can see, the, where, where did this al-Islah community come from? So many of these people, they already knew all of this. 
They were themselves suffocating under the fumes of Gulu and wondering when will there ever be a proper reform movement that will systematically and loud and clear call out all these deviations. And then when Islah came, they naturally reformed. So many others were not, uh, they didn't know any of this is wrong. And they used to think this is all right. But then they listened to Al-Islah, they looked at our evidences, Quran, Hadith, this, Aql, said, man, this is, they're not, these people don't sound like, you know, they might be Ninda Bachas, they might not have the, you know, 70-year-old Marja appearance, but the evidence they are presenting, and they are also quoting the 70 and 80-year Marajas, uh, where their uh, verdicts are matching with the Quran and the hadith of Ahlul Bayt so they saw all of the evidence and said you know what we should support this platform and we should be a part of it and we should uh, encourage it because these people are on something you know they, they, they have a point I think we have gone too far so this way when you present guidance and when you are persevering but for this again as I said you have to use clear language of Quran if Allah has said something is shirk you say shirk not that Oh, in my personal opinion, I don't like it. Or oh, this is problematic. This is stuff you say for things that Allah has not spoken on clearly. I will myself happily use terminology like problematic and this and that for stuff on which Allah is silent. He has not spoken. Rasul is silent. Imam is silent. Then I can say I'm um, personally, you know what, even though Allah, Rasul and Imams are silent, I feel this is, you know, problematic. But on matters where Allah has spoken so clearly in the Quran, in which he has issued such clear threats, here what is the meaning of saying that this is not right or problematic or I disagree with it and uh, but let's not go to the awam, let's not disturb the public, let them continue in their deviation, let us focus on the scholarly side, let us engage with the scholars and this and that. Oh, scholars, you are not going to get anything out of this and then we have already seen, we've already gone through this stage alhamdulillah. And I think Sheikh Ali Karmani, you also mentioned you have discussed istighatha with scholars. You've gone to the house of Qum and discussed with scholars there. What more is there left? So now uh, the guidance is clear. Those scholars who want to support us, let them support us. Those who are silent, may Allah have mercy on them and may Allah forgive them and give them the tawfiq to start speaking so that uh, <clears throat> this reform can spread wider. And those who are opposed to it, uh, we can only do dua for them. But we can't change them. Uh, in the meantime, we can't afford to ignore the masses. Uh, please, I apologize and please forgive me if I've gone on and on and on. But I feel very passionately. This is a very uh, strong disagreement that I have with what you have said. With all the love and respect and the greatest of admiration, I'm putting this before you. I hope you reconsider. And even if you're not willing to reconsider, you say, no, 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 this public reform is not my thing. Maybe, I, I won't blame you, Sheikh, given how much you have been burnt by the masses, any normal person in your position, I would understand, I wouldn't justify, but I would understand if you don't want to deal with the masses anymore because of how mean and how, unfortunately, even we saw it came to violence at Urban Rose because of how they have been like this. If you are scarred by this experience, then that makes perfect sense. And I'm not going to try to pressure you or... Uh, force you into doing something that you don't want to do or that you're not comfortable with but this is because you advance this critique against us and you are trying to pull us away from the awam and the masses so I'm telling you this is why we do not accept this call of yours and we don't see it as a valid call um, ulama they have the sources they have the books they can read and reform anytime they want uh, it is the masses who are disconnected from their sources. It is the masses and the awam that needs to be reminded of the Quran and the Sunnah and the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt And that is why Al-Islah um, and at least my humble lowly self, that is why we are determined to focus on reminding the awam and the public. Okay? And uh, it's not that we are averse to scholarly engagement. It's just that we don't, you know, if you invite me uh, and say, Sayyidina, we're going to the Vatican, to the Catholic Church. We want to speak to the Pope, you know, talk to him about Trinity. You know, we have ac accumulated some good research. You know, if I have nothing else to do, if I have free time to kill, if I, you know, I'm just looking for an opportunity to have a picnic in Rome to visit the historical places in Vatican City, maybe I might come with you. It is not haram to go on such Trips قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِ Incidentally, in Surah al -Rum, Allah ends this by saying كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُشْرِكِينَ The vast majority of people in the past were mushrikeen, were people of shirk, and today we somehow think that shirk is this 
really, you know, it's, it's just, you know, idol worship and it's a really constricted, confined thing. You know, you have to have intention. Niyat has to be there of worship. Then it's only people are so distant from the Quran. So, but what I'm saying is that if I don't have anything better to do in life, then I might travel to the Vatican to speak to the Pope or to engage with the collegium of priests over there. Because I know, uh, you know, even if angels were to descend upon them, they wouldn't be able to, the, the way the system that they're stuck in, um, it's just, you know, unless merges or happens and it's very difficult to imagine how that system is going to budge. So that's why the best way to go about is to deal with the, to address the Christian awam, the way the people who give da'wah, they give da'wah to awam. No one goes to the Catholic Church to give, uh, to the Pope to, to give him da'wah, right? Because they understand the guy knows everything. The man knows everything and still he's not believing. So, you know, there's no point pursuing him. So in the same way, you have, uh, you have similar figures within your own sectarian tradition. I don't see the point in wasting time. But if yeah, if you if uh, you have nothing else better to do and you have already done all the work on the awam front and you have free time to kill, I don't uh, I wouldn't mind. Um, but I I don't see this as the priority. So in our case, we have a upside down difference. You wanna prioritize scholarship, I want to prioritize Quran, the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, and those statements and testimonies of scholars which agree with what the Quran and Ahlul Bayt have said clearly, I'm happy to quote those scholarly statements. We take these three pieces of evidence, present them to the awam relentlessly day in and day night until more and more eyes open up and people return back to the original vision of the Quran and the actual uh, God-centric, Allah-focused, Allah-centric, Rabbani way of life, which both the Quran teaches us and which the Prophet ﷺ and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt exemplified and embodied with their own personal lives. Until people return to that, we keep on working with the awam, we keep on admonishing them. Even if they have deeply platformed and erected a wall of China between us, Alhamdulillah, the Great Wall of China has been subdued Thanks to the support, the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the technological arrangements and the support that we have received from the community, uh, technologically, infrastructurally, um, logistically, to do this work even from uh, behind the Great Wall of China that they have tried to erect to block us from reaching out to our community members, our beloved community members and our youths and these beloved and blessed Desi and Khoja communities that have given us so much uh, and that and whom we desire to repay um, by giving them the best of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with in terms of insight into his book and guidance of his book and the best teachings of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim of salatu wasalam. So I hope Sheikh, uh, I was again very passionate in my arguments. I hope uh, I don't, if anything came across as as hurtful or offensive. I apologize for that. That's not the intention. But this is something that I very firmly believe in. I cannot sign up for any call that says awam is not the priority. Lay people are not the priority. Uh, you know, scholarly engagement and scholarly this and locking ourselves in ivory towers and going to World Federation meetings where they lock us inside a room with scholars only. And in outside, the awam is dying of shirk, of ghulu, of iftiraz upon Allah, of all the things that Allah has promised and threatened the worst humiliation and punishments for in his noble book, which is hujja upon us until the day of judgment. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.